I'd like to start my talk by thanking Mariam because um, I remember years ago when I first uh, decided to leave Islam and feeling alone and um, thinking are there possibly any other people who think the way that I do and I came across Mariam on the internet and got in touch with her and um, it's, you know, she's, uh, she gives a lot of hope to people. So thank you very much, Mariam. Um, to just, uh, I would like to discuss my experience as a Somali growing up in a community um, that was mainly Muslim and it, its attitude towards apostasy and what I um, grew up with. So to most Somalis, their identity is intertwined with Islam, so much so that they see themselves as an entirely Muslim nation. To be a Somali means to be a Muslim. The Somali word that is used to describe someone who is not a Muslim or an infidel is the word gal. Gal is not a good word. It's a word that is despised. It's a word that is usually used as an insult. Um, I remember a lot of times where when my younger brother and sister who were close in age, when they would have a fight, and my brother being stronger than my sister, would be rough with her, and my mum would angrily rep insult him and say, you gal, stop hurting your sister. So along with disbelief, the word gal implies a lack of empathy, empathy a cruel nature, and a stranger who cannot be identified in our tribal system. Hatred for the Gal in modern Somali psyche can be traced back to their memory of colonization. Somalia, because of its strategic location, was a valuable trade route uh, for, to India, the Middle East and beyond, and so it attracted the attention of the British in the north who proclaimed it as a protectorate and the south uh, was colonized by Italy. And Somalis have preserved the memories of um, colonization through their rich oral tradition, stories that they tell to their children uh, of the horrors that were faced uh, by the indigenous people. One particular story I remember is my mum told me that the British used to um, lay young Somali men who were rebellious on their backs and they used to walk over them um, when there was rain just to sort of humiliate them so they don't get their shoes dirty. Um, now I don't know how authentic that story is but these are the types of stories that were passed on. I remember the first time I saw a gal um, it was uh, one of my uncles who worked in Geneva and was based there came uh, to Somalia to my grandmother's house where I was living at the time and he brought with him a, a colleague or a friend who a white man who clearly was a gal and um, <laughs> clearly a gal and, um, and I just remember my grandmother I was about five or six and I remember how flustered my grandmother got and it really threw her. Was, traditionally, when um, Somalis uh, serve uh, uh, a meal to somebody, they serve the friends in a common plate to share. But that's assuming that friend is a Muslim. But now there's a gal in the equation, what does she do? So she decided, she thought quickly and decided that she was going to serve them separately. And I remember her saying, oh, you know, I don't have, uh, do I have enough food? Gals have seven compartments to their stomachs. Oh. He'll, he'll eat me out of home. You know, do I, do I have enough food to give, to, you know, to, to give this gal? Okay. So when she gave them the food and the men went on their way, she, um, I remember her speaking to her neighbor about how she was gonna deal with the plate. She said, do, do I cleanse it in a special way, like when a dog eats or touches a plate, like to wash it seven times? Or do I just discard of it? What do I do? So, you know, those are the memories that are entrenched of my, um, the attitudes that I witnessed earlier on. Somalis are very, uh, they're fiercely <coughs> tribal uh, people. And they are very, divi they're divided and they don't agree on anything. Um, but there is a national symbol that they all agree on. Um, it's um, Sayyid Abdullah Hassan, um, who 
I'm sure a lot of the people who are familiar with their British history uh, or the colonization history might have heard of. Uh, I remember as a little girl being um, driven in a little bus, I was in the first grade, and seeing this statue in the center of Mogadishu of this uh, magnificent horse and a uh, warrior who was wielding a, a sword. And I was told that Sayyid Abdullah Hassan, he's the father of our nation. And when I read about him and, and, and understood what he actually did, um, it seems like he united the, um, the Somali tribes in a jihad against the British. And what he did was he asked all the tribes to give bay'ah or um, allegiance to him under his leadership, under his khilafah, and if they didn't agree to it, he would declare them as gal, unbeliever. Um, one of the, most of the tribes did give him bay'ah, but there was um, one particular tribe that didn't, and that's a tribe that I come from proudly. <laughs> and uh, I remember a cousin of mine telling me about my grandfather, Farah, um, that he fiercely fought the Darawish, which were the soldiers of the, of, of the Sayyid, and they were declared as, as, as Gal. And, um, and, and apparently my grandfather killed 300 Darawish, completely doubt that story. Somalis have a way of exaggerating uh, figures, but at least it establishes um, that I'm not the only infidel in my family. Um, following when we had the collapse of um, the uh, Somali uh, dictatorship in 1991, many Somalis, uh, such as myself, found themselves um, seeking refuge in the West and um, living as minorities in Gal societies. Um, it was very challenging for people of my mother's generation because they were so concerned that now that they found themselves in the, in the land of the despised Gal, to protect, to protect themselves and their children from losing their faith. So they fervently turned to their religion and a revival ensued within the Somali community. Somali women went from wearing dira, which is a traditional sort of kaftan, colorful style dresses that, uh, that they wore, to plain jilbabs, which is a literal translation of what hijab was described as in the Quran. And, and I'm sure a lot of you, if you've come across Somali women in London, you see them in their big jilbabs. Somali homes, such as my home, became a hub of Islamic studies. Several days, say Mondays and Tuesdays, we would have um, a sheikh would come, they would teach us things about, they would teach us lessons on tafsir, Quran translation, on hadith books, they would go through uh, books like um, Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, one of the, you know, things that we never, we were Muslim, but we didn't study Islam to that extent. Weddings became segregated, Be people became literalist, turning to the Quran and Sunnah, because to them, to the Somalis, like my mother, like my aunt, like my uncles, Islam provided them with a sense of moral superiority to non-Muslims, to the Gal. So the Gal might have this world, but the Muslims had the true life, the hereafter. They viewed Western society as one that is morally depraved, and they wanted to protect their children from it. Parents encouraged their children to be educated in Islam as a way of preserving their cultural identity and to resist assimilation. So finally, in 2004, when I finally found the courage to tell my mother that I was having doubts about Islam, I was telling her that I was, what she was hearing is that Amal wants to become a gal. And a cruel infidel. So along with her fears for my salvation, a gal is in her, you know, the way that in her worldview, a gal is someone who's destined for eternal damnation and hellfire. She was also horrified about the reaction, the negative reaction she would get, that I would get, that she would get as my mother from the rest of the community. Amal has become a gal, a sheep that has been lost to the wolves. Her reaction was to cut her losses and to save the remaining flock, my five siblings. So she purchased a ticket to Dubai and then to Mogadishu, where the, at the time, uh, the Union of Islamic Courts had established Sharia law. Because in her view, 
there was only one way that she was going to guarantee the faith of her children, and that was to remove any other options, all other options. My mother has subsequently, after she'd went to Somalia, asked me to join her. And at the time, she was living in Al-Shabaab-controlled territory. So as you can imagine, I turned down the offer. <laughs> um, there are numerous cases, um, and I'm not going to go through them all, but I do recommend a website called Wil Wilkie Islam that um, talks about the cases um, of people that have been beheaded, shot, killed um, in Somalia because they either have been um, accused of apostasy, because there are Muslims who have been accused and killed for it, um, or genuinely converted to uh, Christianity, or uh, to be honest with you, there isn't a problem with atheists in Somalia. It tends to be Christian people converting to Christianity. Um, but th there are many, many cases. And I'd like to end on a, um, just to give you an idea of where the discussion of, on leaving Islam is in the Somali community. Um, there was recently a, a book written by um, a sheikh called Abdi Ismail. Um, and now this is a, you know, by Islamic standards, this is a classical scholar who studied in Medina University. And he wrote a book called The Rule of Apostasy in Islam, Is It True? And he explains that he was inspired by the case of the uh, Maryam Ibrahim, the Sudanese woman who was imprisoned and um, threatened with death uh, for converting to Christianity. And needless to say, um, it wasn't received very well in the Somali community at all. Um, he has received numerous death threats. Um, he has been declared a gal, a non-believer, an apostate. Um, by many uh, prominent Somali sheikhs. Uh, he is currently in hiding. Uh, he's been dubbed Somalia's Salman Rushdie <laughs> for writing this book. Not sure how uh, that, co that comparison can be made. Um, but most upsetting, uh, he has family. Um, he lives in Kenya, but he has a, a wife and children who are in Somalia, and he's forbidden to go and see them. He's basically been told, don't bother coming. Um, because you're not welcome here. Just for questioning the rule of, you know, should we really kill off our states? Um, so, yeah. So there's a long way to go to change attitudes in the Somali community. Thank you very much for your time.